Welcome to Yoga Santa Barbara Style. This program showcases Santa Barbara area yoga teachers by presenting a brief interview along with a 25 minute practice featuring the guest instructor. Today our guest will be Adrian Hengel. Adrian currently owns and teaches at the Power of Your Own Studio in Victoria Court. My name is Ray Colby and I'm the host of Yoga Santa Barbara Style. I've been practicing yoga for a number of years and I'm here to share my passion for yoga with you. We've got a great show for you today. In addition to our yoga sequence and interview, I'll present the second in a series on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Today we'll discuss yamas and niyamas, and we'll break down the pose high lunge. Sarah Remick will discuss gifts for yogis, and in her Food for Thought segment, she'll discuss stress-reducing aids. So let's get right to it. Here's Sarah with Yoga News. Thank you, Ray. Well, the holidays are fully upon us, and as the gift-giving season is soon to hit its peak, I thought I would highlight some cool gift ideas for the yogi or yogini in your life this holiday season. Maybe your son or granddaughter or brother-in-law came home for the holidays with a newfound love for stretchy pants and green drinks, blankly staring at you at any given time with his or her legs and arms twisted around like a human Gumby doll. And as you stare back at them, unwittingly trying to win this creative new style of don't blink first, you may think to yourself, what in the world am I supposed to get this bendy, I don't eat meat anymore, let's try drinking water without ice today kind of person that used to be so simple and easy to buy for? Well, gift giving for your beloved yogi is much easier than you think. First off, most yogis love the natural world in many capacities. So a cool gift idea might be tea light holders made out of driftwood. You can make them yourself really easily, or you can look for some at the Sunday Art Walk along Cabrillo Boulevard. White sage, fresh or dried, for aromatic purposes or to help dissipate negative energies. It's a wonderful yogi gift. Noe at Yes Yes Nursery has wonderful sage starters, or you can find dried sage at some of the local yoga, stu yoga studios here in town. And even some vendors outside of the market on Saturdays have sage that they've handpicked and dried themselves. We have a new REI in town, and your yogi might love a new pair of hiking shoes, or a new wick dry top, or a camping accessory. A headlamp is more useful than you will ever know, and for so much more than camping. Now, Paradise Found on Anna Pamu is a little gem in the world of Walmart wreaths and Costco-sized chicken pot pies. If you want to find something really meaningful or special for your yogi loved one, this is one of the best spots in town. They've got crystal salt lamps, owl tea mugs, tarot cards, and mermaid calendars. Inspirational books galore. Look at the artist's way, one of my favorites. Incredible music CDs. Um, Jesse Rhodes, Wonderland, an amazing album. You can find it online at his website. And an array of DVDs. Like Five Elements Tai Chi, wonderful DVD. They've got stuffed Ganesha dolls and magical journals, statues of many different deities, candles, angel cards, one of my all-time favorite things. These are so fun to play with. And really, every kind of divination card. There's animal spirit, Louise Hay affirmations, whatever you could want, really. Jewelry from local artists, and so much more. You know, Whole Foods, Lazy Acres, and the Isla Vista Co-op are also great places to find really cool gifts. You may not think of a grocery store as the place to find the next present under the tree, but I'm not talking about just food. Although, any food from those stores in my stocking would be really awesome. But I'm talking more like the lifestyle stuff. Whole Foods has quite an array of vibrant cookbooks for all dietary types. They've got one of my favorite companies, Threads for Thought, organic cotton zip-up hoodies for 20 bucks, and the cutest beanies and striped socks, all sustainably manufactured organic cotton. Plus, any yogi would be stoked to unwrap some Kate's Magic or Simpler's fragrance or essential oils. Of course, a case of kombucha or my favorite women's multivitamin would make me super happy too. 
Lazy Acres has some great kitchenware, all kinds of fun things like mortar and pestles, make your own ice cream kits or funky wine glasses. They also have super comfy organic cotton leggings, salt, crystal salt lamps as well, which I would really like for Christmas in case anyone's listening. A vast tea selection, really nice ceramic neti pots, sustainable earrings made from coconut, and my favorite, rosehip seed oil facial serum. And any yogi would be stoked to receive some arnica massage oil in their stocking, as it's incredible on achy muscles. And I scored these super cute peacock yoga pants on the sale rack at Drishti. If you're looking for some really classy and beautiful yoga-inspired gear that's not crazy expensive and that supports a small local business, Drishti is the place. It's right next to Sojourner on Canon Perdido, and not only do they have some of the cutest yoga-inspired clothing I've ever seen, but they have a wonderful book section where I got my favorite book, Yoga for Partners, the amazing photos, and some of the prettiest jewelry in town. Plus, they usually have a sales rack out front where you can score great deals, like my pants. And of course, there's all kinds of gifty hoo-hahs at local yoga studios. But what your yogi might love the most is a gift certificate to one of the studios, a couple of classes on a gift card or a series package. Now that's the gift that keeps on giving all year long. So this holiday season, get into the spirit and think outside of the mat. Whether you go big or not so big, the real gift is being with those you love and sharing the spirit of gratitude. Object-focused meditation is a visual meditation involving an external physical item. Since we are conditioned to be task-oriented since childhood, we have learned to keep the mind from drifting by giving it a task to focus on. Object-focused meditation makes use of this conditioning by getting the mind to focus on the object in front of you. It tricks the mind into staying in the present moment. The nature of the specific physical item to use for the meditation is not that important. It is a matter of personal preference, and anything from a candle flame to a picture of a deity to a flower to a rock could be used, although I suggest that either the object be one you care deeply about, or living, or both. The external object of attention is useful in as much as it acts as a point of reference to which the mind can easily be tethered. Every time it strays, you simply need to bring it back to the object. However, the chosen object should meet two conditions. It should be small enough so it can be scrutinized without having to move your head, and it should be big enough so you don't have to strain your eyes to study its details. There are slightly different ways in which object-focused meditation can be done, but it is easier to do it as follows. Start with a breath count meditation to stabilize the mind as a prelude to moving the attention outward to the external object. Once the mind is calm and present, open your eyes and study the object. Observe every detail in a non-discursive way. Notice how light falls on the object. Does it induce any changes in its texture or color? How sharp are the lines of its edges? Is the object's surface rough or smooth? Simply observe and refrain from putting labels on what you see and try to lose any judgment other than an, attra than an attraction. The meditation acts as a direct antidote to the poison of fragmented observation, which afflicts almost every single one of us. It truly is a scourge of the modern age. Constant bombardment of our senses with stimuli overwhelms their ability to pay complete attention to one object or event at a time. Object-focused meditation disrupts this status quo and sharpens our ability to focus. It tames the mind and strengthens the will. It gives us power. As you progress in your practice, you will find that thoughts disappear, and as they do, you start experiencing profound peace and serenity within. Even the external object of meditation will transform into an object of ceaseless wonder. You will soon catch yourself deriving intense pleasure from the most mundane of objects. For these reasons, object-focused meditation comes highly recommended for beginners who may find 
stilling the mind during meditation difficult. Meditation techniques, like other techniques of yoga, such as asana practice and pranayama, are just techniques to get us started. Once you have acquired the skills, then the technique begins to dissolve. Think about it this way. Learning one of these techniques is analogous to learning to play a specific instrument. Once you've mastered the technique, then you can begin to invent new jazz riffs or become creative in the ways that you use the technique. It's the same here. Once you've mastered the technique, you may use it or adapt it or do something completely different. Allow your heart to guide you. In peace and love, Namaste. Our guest today is Adrian Hingles, and she's the owner of the Power of Your Own Yoga Studio at 1221 State Street, which is in the Victoria Court. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Ray. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Good, so nice to have you here today. Thanks for asking me to come. How long have you been practicing yoga? Probably about 10 years, on and off. What do you consider to be the greatest benefits of yoga? Just the connection that you can actually have with your body and understanding that in a controlled environment without the distractions of everything else that's going on in life to be able to see when you are making a big deal about something um, that might come up like in a yoga pose that you're holding for a long time. And I think it's just really it giving people a chance, myself included, a chance to really get to know yourself and see when you're having those reactions and um, know what's like what's truly happening versus like the illusion that you're making up. So you're, you're talking about emotion and feelings mm -hmm. and sensations yeah. that occur in our, in our bodies in some sense, right. whether it's emotional or physical. Right, and so it's like if you do any, any sort of movement, whether it's, I mean, yoga itself, the physical practice is the, is the asana practice, but literally you could be doing yoga when you're doing stand-up paddling or out riding a bike. It's just a matter of how much you're connecting with what you're doing versus everything else that's in the outside world, I think. Um, and knowing kind of the body sensation that you're having, that it's just a body sensation. And anything else that you sort of bring to the table on it is something else that you're mentally bringing versus what's really happening. Sure. And I think being able to address that is simply on your yoga mat helps you to address it everywhere else you go. What do you consider to be the greatest risks associated with yoga? The biggest risk I feel is feeling like you can't start now. Um, people feel like they have to be ready, they have to be super fit, they have to have lost all their weight or have all their stuff figured out. And, and really it's come as you are, I mean, whether you're broken, battered, haven't figured things out, just got out of a messy relationship or in a messy relationship or whatever it might be, but just waiting for that day that you're gonna be ready to show up. So from a risk standpoint, I feel like it's the risk of not starting. Um, and so we automatically think that a one hour yoga class one day a week is all of a sudden going to make magic happen in our body and it definitely will help but it's like having that consistent practice because if, if you're doing something for eight hours a day and you're only doing something else to counteract it one hour a week, like how quickly is the change going to happen? And so for you, what do you think that relationship should be? I mean, how often should someone that say someone that's new to yoga, mm -hmm. how often should they start practice? If they, if they come to a class and say, gee, this is something that I would like to do, I think, how, uh, what would you suggest for them to, to begin their practice? I suggest people to, to do it every day, six days a week, give yourself a day off, like to have like a restorative practice. Because um, the thing is, is you can always do what you can. And what I found for myself personally is um, in Aside from doing yoga, I, I do triathlons, and there's a lot of days where I come to a class and I'm so exhausted, so tired, but I at least get to the mat, and I'm like, okay, we'll just see what happens. And I might feel exhausted, like I can't do anything, and all of a sudden, there's some inner strength that shows up and I'm able to do more than I thought. And then there's days where I show up and I feel so strong and so ready, and all I wanna do is just sit in child's pose or take Shavasana, and I always encourage students to just listen what your body has, is able to do that day, because no matter what, if you're, if you're spending time, whether it's 60 minutes, however long a class might be, a 90 minute class, you're giving yourself that time for yourself versus spending it trying to get a million other things done. Um, and I think that's one thing that as we get busier and busier with 
more technology and more things to do and more places that we have to go, it's taking that time, whether it's 20 minutes a day doing your own home practice or an hour doing it in a studio every day, just getting that time in for yourself. Why do you teach yoga? I teach yoga because um, I feel like once you've learned something and it's sort of your your duty to teach it. And in order, for me, I've learned that the more I teach something, I think the more I learn it myself. And it's funny because I'll be going through, one of my teachers always says, like, in order to be a good teacher, you have to have a like, spiritual practice yourself. And I notice that when I'm teaching more, I'm starting to, I sort of relate my, um, my life into my teaching as well. And I start to see the things that are become, coming up as issues for me. I'm like, oh wait, didn't you just, weren't you just talking about that in class, but yet you're not living it in your own life? And so it's like being that example. It wasn't until I went to teacher training that I really, I feel like, I don't know, quote unquote, understood what it was. Because before it was just a physical practice, like move your body, stretch a little bit, get stronger, this is great. But then when I went to teacher training and I was like, oh, this is, this is what yoga is. It's this, you know, actually having that full connection of that it is, it's physical practice, but it's really to access the craziness that you have going on in your head. And so I feel like since I've learned that, it's like my duty, my calling to be able to teach it and teach it in the most authentic way that I can so other people can change their lives. And what style do you teach? I teach uh, Baptiste Power Vinyasa Yoga, and it's basically um, a s series of poses um, just brought together without any goals of perfection or rigid rules in class. And it's, um, it's a, I would say, a vigorous form of yoga. It's not like you're not just sitting and not just stretching, but you're moving your body. And it's just really about shifting energy. So the moment that you get into class, you know, you're going from an outside world in to your own self, um, and also, and, but also in a way that's challenging and bringing people to a place, encouraging them to get to their edge so that um, they can see that it's possible to go past where they thought that they were limited by their mind. Mm. Besides yoga, what are your favorite activities? Well, like I said, I do triathlons. Yeah. Um, so swimming, biking, running. Um, being outside, um, I moved to Santa Barbara from the Midwest and didn't have the opportunity to spend 12 months of the year outside. You know. The, the world is meant to be explored kind of thing, and I want to do as much as I can. And in, in the other activities that you do in your life, mm -hmm. how do you feel yoga changes that, or do you see benefits from yoga? Oh, hugely. Um, just in triathlon alone, my first, um, I've been doing the sport since 2007, and at my first race, um, I've always been competitive when, since I was little, um, was an athlete growing up, and I was, I towed the line and you basically, it's a beach start. So you run in from the beach, you go into the water. It starts with a, it was started with a 750 meter swim. And I was so excited, I'm ready, I'm trained. And I got in the water and completely freaked out. And so all the training that I had done of like swimming, putting your head down in the water and swimming like freestyle swim, I like literally could not figure out how to do it because I was in a downright panic. And at that point in time, there, I don't think there was any idea of what, how my yoga practice could help. But now that I've been doing it for so long, um, I'm swimming out in the ocean now like two days a week. And I think just like any person, there's like the, I, the ocean comes with a lot of unknowns, like what's under the water and how's this gonna go? And especially when you jump in the water with like 100 other people at the same time, there's a lot of chaos. And it's being able to manage the chaos and be able to keep calm because you can't only control what you can control and that's yourself. Um, so there's times where I'll be swimming and I'll be thinking, I'm gonna swim right in, my, my hand's gonna go right into a shark's mouth or there's someone's gonna, like my imagination can go crazy. And it's, it's having that kind of groundedness of saying like, okay, where are you right now? Is that, okay, that's a possibility that it can happen, but it's not happening now. And so it's like coming back to listening to the sound of my breath um, and focusing on that so that the craziness in my, in my thoughts can go away. Um, so the, the swim for sure is the biggest thing, I think, from letting my imagination get away with me. Um, with cycling, it's just, in cycling and running both, it's just not only from a physical standpoint of just keeping my body much more open and flexible to create like more power as I'm moving forward, um, and, but just being 
focusing on each, like the six inches in front of your face versus like getting to that next mile or that next mile, because it's not about what's happening later or what's happened before, but what's going on at that exact moment. Well, Adrian, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're really pleased thank to you. have you here. And Adrian, just a final question. Is there, do you have a website or some way that people can reach you online? I do, yes. That's the website's powerofyourown.com and it lists all the information anyone needs to get started, what to bring to class, class schedule, class prices, and um, that's it. Well, thank you so much and thank you for being on the show today. We've really enjoyed having you. Thank you, it was great. Appreciate it. And just take your knees out nice and wide, really wide on your mat, if they're not already there. And big deep breaths in and out through your nose. Take a full breath in and a big exhale. And then come up on the hands and knees and press up into downward facing dog. Yeah, and just settle in here, pedal your legs out, shake your head yes and no. Focusing on your breath and just moving things around. Take your right leg, send it up and back. Bend your knee, open your hip. Take your right leg up higher, big inhale. Breathe out all the way. Big, big inhale. Now open it up even more. Take a full breath in. Right foot down. Send your left leg up and back. Big, big inhale. Open it up, exhale. Lift it up higher, breathe in. Big exhale. Two more breaths, lift it higher. Open even more. Big, big inhale, left foot down. Now shift yourself forward right into high plank. And just press down through your hands, back through your heels. Soften the space in between your shoulder blades. Soften your jaw, your face, your eyes. Take a really big breath in, empty it out. One more, big inhale. Now low push up, exhale. Upward dog, lift your chest, tops of your feet on the floor, and downward facing dog, take it back. And then we'll do that again, this time with breath. So come forward, high plank, one breath in. Low push up, exhale. Up dog, breathe in. Downward dog. And again, high push up. Low push up. Up dog. Down dog. One more time, high push up, breathe in, big breath. Low push up, exhale. Upward dog, down dog. Good, now take a full breath in. Empty it out. Big breath in again. Empty it out. Huge breath in. Empty all the way out. Look to your hands. Jump to your hands. Halfway up, breathe in and bow forward. Rise all the way to stand. And bring your hands together at your heart. Take three breaths together, inhale, exhale. Fill up, let it out. Big breath in, empty all the way. And look up, reach up, full breath in. Bow forward all the way down. Now come up halfway, lengthen. Chaturanga, walk or jump to low push up. Upward dog fill, downward facing dog. Take a full breath in, breathe out. All the way in again, all the way out. Now huge breath in, empty all the way, jump to the top. Halfway lift, big inhale, bow forward all the way down. 
Now reach up all the way. Big, big, big inhale. Bow forward, empty out. Halfway, lengthen. Chaturanga, take it back. Upward dog, downward facing dog. Three breaths again, big inhale. Huge breath out. Really drop your head, big inhale. Good, breathe out. Last one, big breath in. Empty all the way out. Jump to the top. Halfway lift, fold down. Reach again, all the way up. This time a little back bend, look back. Bow forward. Halfway lift, big inhale. Chaturanga, send it back. Up dog, down dog. Take a giant breath in, empty it out. Again, all the way in, all the way out. Full breath in, empty all the way. Jump to the top. Halfway up, fold down. Feet together, Utkatasana, so chair pose. Reach back and sink really low in your chair. Really bring the weight into your heels and lift your toes off the mat. And then look up. Big smiles. You're so glad to be here today. Now relax your shoulders. Now look up, big, big inhale. And then just sink back. Now reach your arms further up and back. Good, breathe all the way out. Couple more breaths, inhale. Sink down lower. Let the legs shake a little bit, breathe in. It just means you're alive, breathe out. Huge breath in, exhale. Reach back a little more, bow forward. Halfway lift, lengthen your spine. Chaturanga, send it back. Upward dog. Downward facing dog, right foot forward, warrior one, reach up, full breath in, and then stay, breathe out. Now same thing, look up, breathe in, and sink your hips down lower, exhale. Good, reach further back. Nice, breathe out. Now reach further back, more, more, more. Good, breathe out. Take a further back bend, inhale. Chaturanga, let it out. Upward dog, downward facing dog. Left foot forward, warrior one, reach up on the inhale, and then just land as you breathe out. Keep reaching up, and then keep landing, keep sinking. Big, big inhale, breathe all the way out. Now reach further back, let your shoulders melt down your back. Two more breaths, inhale, big exhale, now reach back a little further, chaturanga. Upward dog, downward facing dog. Take a full inhale, let it out. All the way in, let it out. Huge breath in, empty all the way out. Jump to the top. Now halfway, really fill up. Bow forward, empty. Chair, this time one breath in, fold forward. Halfway, lengthen up. Chaturanga, send it back. Upward dog, really fill. Downward facing dog, right foot forward, warrior one. Reach up, this time one breath up. Back down, Chaturanga. So let it be a little messy, it's totally fine. Up dog, downward facing dog. Left side, warrior one, reach, fill up your breath. Back down, chaturanga. Upward dog, downward facing dog. Take a full breath in, empty it all the way out. Big breath in again, empty out. Now last one, really fill up. Empty out all the way, jump forward. Halfway up. Bow down, chair, big inhale, fold, exhale, halfway up, chaturanga, upward dog, really fill up, 
Downward facing dog. Right foot forward, warrior one. Reach all the way back. Take it down, chaturanga. Just moving with your breath. Upward dog, big, big inhale. Downward facing dog. Left side, warrior one. Reach way back like a little back bend. Take it down low. Up dog. Downward facing dog. Take a full breath in. Empty it out. Big, big inhale. Breathe out. Last one, all the way in. Empty it out. Send your right leg up and back. Sweep it through to crescent lunge. And just reach the arms up. And then take this into a little back bend. So plant through the front heel, press through the back heel, and lean your upper body back. And start to look further up and back on the ceiling. See if you can see something new on the ceiling. Maybe like even you see a new light behind you. Go towards the light. <laughs> Take a really big inhale. Bring your hands to your heart. Full breath in. Twist to the right. Now stay hands in your prayer or fly them floor to ceiling. And then bringing breath into your twist. So lengthen your spine, breathe in. And then twist open more, breathe out. Do that again, inhale. Big exhale. Big, big, big inhale. All the way out. All the way in. Now empty it completely out. Rise up to warrior two. So spin open. And just land here. Now take a full breath in. Extended side angle. So right arm to your right thigh or your hand to the floor. Now let the front knee be bent. And then even do this. You can grab a block and bring your hand to the block. Take the top arm, extend it towards the window. So that's the extended part of the pose. Take it down, chaturanga. Upward dog, downward facing dog. Send your left leg, sweep it up, take it forward, crescent lunge. And then relax the shoulders down your back. And then do the same thing like before, press through the front heel, use that as your anchor, and lean into a back bend. Relax the shoulders. So keep lifting up through the center of your chest, and leaning back, leaning back a little more, a little more. Take a full inhale, hands at your heart. Full breath in, spin to your left. And then same thing, just like before, hands can stay or fly on floor to ceiling. And then use your back leg more, so press through the heel. Yeah, fire up that back thigh. And then breathe together. Three more breaths. Inhale together. And let it all the way out. All the way in. Big exhale. Now last one. Really fill it up. Empty it out. Come up, warrior two. And just land in it. Take a full breath in. Extended side angle. And if you notice that your breath starts to pick up pace, like it starts to get really fast, just become aware of it. And it's from that awareness that we can start to create the change, to slow things down, to make it actually easier instead of hard. Inhale again, breathe out. Last one, big breath in, chaturanga. Upward facing dog, downward facing dog. Take a giant breath in, let it out. Another one, big inhale. Stick out your tongue this time. Do that again, big inhale. Let it all the way out. One more, big inhale. Empty it out. Come forward into high plank. Lower down into low push up. Back into high push up. Down low, back up. Down low, back up, inhale. Down low, exhale. Back up, inhale. Down low, 
Upward dog, fill up. Downward dog. Come forward again, high push up. Slowly lower down, five, four, three, two, one. Take one ear to your mat, arms down by your side. And just take a couple seconds here. Take your chin to the mat. Reach your arms forward like you're flying like Superman. Now take a big inhale. Breathe out all of your air and lift your whole body up. Breathe in and then stay up. Breathe out. Now keep your neck long, so just look down to the top of your mat or the floor. Lift up higher. Good. Breathe out. Two more breaths. Inhale up. Exhale it out. All the way up. Come down. Take a full breath in. Breathe all the way out. And then come up. Again, Superman. Now this time I want you to do like a little swimming. So you're like one of those little wind-up toys that you put in the bathtub. Yeah, so just keep going. Arms moving, legs moving. And when you get to that point where you don't want to do this anymore, stay there just a little longer. You don't have to stay forever. And just breathe. And the moment that you start to feel like you can't even move parts of your body, like it takes a little bit too much mental capacity, that's good too. So let go of thinking, let go of doing, and just keep going. Five, a little bit more swimming. Four, three, two, lower down. All right, bend your knees, grab your feet. Bow pose, so stay on your bellies. Take a full inhale. Now breathe all the way out. Lift your body up, big inhale. Nice, now breathe out. Lift up higher, huge breath in. Good, breathe out. Two more breaths, go up higher. Big exhale. Kick your shins further back, lower down. Press into upward facing dog. And back to downward dog. Now either walk or jump through your hands. Land on your bums. Lie on your back. And press right up into bridge pose. Bring your knees together to touch, your feet together to touch. Keep your knees squeezing. Send your right leg towards the window. And now keep your hips up high and knees together. So walk your foot, Robin, a little bit closer to the window. So walk, yeah, there you go. So plant through your heel. You're working your hamstrings a lot here. Yeah, mm-hmm, yummy. Weaker part of our body that we don't like to work. <laughs> hips up higher. Keep the breath going. That's the instant path to presence. Other side. Now do the best you can. Keep the knees together. Hips higher. You can use your hands as a bind underneath you to press down or grab onto the sides of your mat. Take the hips up two more inches. Go up a little more. Lower everything to the ground. All the way in with your breath. Let it out now and bridge or wheel. Set your hands by your ears, Urdhvadanyarasana. Go for it. And just see what happens. The first step towards making any changes is taking the step, and then you always can choose to change your mind. You can try it and then come down and do something different. Take a full breath in, lower down. Take a big, big inhale. Let it all the way out. Go up again. Bridge, wheel. Take a full breath. Lower down. Big inhale. Let it out. Rise again. Go for it. Five, four, sometimes for some reason the counting helps. Three, two, come down. Take a full breath in, let it out, 
Go up again. This might be the last one. This might be. You don't know. Take a big inhale. Lower down. Suptavada. It was the last one. Maybe. Knees out to the side. Now keep your feet squeezing together and lift your feet about a foot off the floor. Bring your hands behind your head. Yeah, lift the feet up off the floor. And keep squeezing them, really getting into like those, those really deep abs. Now take a breath in. Bring your elbows towards your knees, exhale. And then come back down and back up. Now keep going with that and as you come up, Lift your butt off the floor too, so you're using both your lower abs and your upper abs. And then to get really deep in the abs, keep squeezing the feet together. So just pressing, even just the ball mounts of your big toes together. Good, we'll do 10 more. Nine, eight, seven. Keep your elbows wide. Six. Five, keep lifting the butts. Four, three, two, one. Shins parallel to the floor. Extend your right leg to the window, right elbow to your left knee, and then just pulse this side for 10, nine, eight, seven. Big exhales as you come up. Four, three, two, one. Pedal it out like a bicycle. Opposite elbow, opposite knee, twisting side to side. Five, four, three, two, one. To the other side. Now pulse to the opposite side. Ten. Good. Nine. Bring your shoulder more than just your elbow. Six, five. Good. Four, three, two, one. Pedal it out. Like really fast biking downhill. Like you're out of control almost, but still in control. Five, four, three, two, one. Grab your knees. Ah. Rock and roll your body forward and back on your mat. Three big body rocks, and then everybody meeting in dead bug. Yeah, so lie on your back. As you grab the bottoms of your feet, you can take one leg, straighten it out, bend the other one, just really rock it into the hips into your IT bands, your hamstrings, any places that's tight. Take your right knee into your chest. Give it a good squeeze. Extend your left leg to the window and take a twist over to the left side of the room. And switch to the other side. And Shavasana, final rest. And if you have a towel to cover your eyes with, that might be nice. Take a really full breath in. Let it go. Wiggle your hands and your fingers, your toes. 
Roll over to your right side. And come up to a seated position, eyes closed, hands at your heart center. Take a full breath in, let it out. Inhale again, exhale. One big ohm, big inhale. Thumbs to your forehead center. The light in me honors the amazing powerful light in each of you. Together we say, Namaste. Namaste. Great job. Yeah. Welcome to Food for Thought. Now that summer is over and those carefree, sun-baked beach day feelings are gone, our days are filled of to-do lists and endless events on our calendars, we may find ourselves lacking energy, overwhelmed or anxious, plagued with little pains, basically stressed out. The definition of stress varies, but it generally is said that stress is a negative concept that can have an impact on mental and physical well-being. I'd like to add emotional well-being to that definition. The definition's a little more unclear after this point, but I subscribe to the idea that chronic or excessive stress does have a negative effect on our minds and bodies in many ways. Of course, stress does have a purpose in our body, the fight-or-flight response is necessary if we come to an accident on the 101 and need to lift a car off of an injured person, or if we're on a sunset hike in the back country and all of a sudden we have to run like heck from a mountain lion or something like that. But when, due to a huge array of stressors our current lives entail, when we're in a chronic or constant state of fight or flight, when we carry around stress as if it's a natural part of our emotional and mental makeup, it can have very adverse effects. The stress response slows down or completely shuts off digestive processes. Over time, stress can suppress the immune system, making us more susceptible to infection and making it harder to fight infection once ill. Stress can make us exhausted, drained, lethargic, grumpy. Some people overeat, some people undereat when they're stressed. Sleep, sleep patterns can be disturbed, either not being able to sleep enough or wanting to do nothing but sleep. Gastrointestinal upset, muscle tension, aches and pains, and so many more symptoms can all be a result of stress. So today, I'd like to share with you some simple remedies to help cope with all of this stress. Soothing music. Whatever it is that you resonate with that relaxes you when you hear it, those are great sounds to listen to before bed or throughout the day or in your car when you're feeling all stressed. I'd like to talk about herbs for a little bit. There are so many herbs out there and they can get pretty specific in their effects and their usage. I've tried today to just cover the broad spectrum without getting into the specifics, though you can go so much deeper into herbal therapy if you choose to. And always, with anything I spout off about in these segments, do your own research, be aware of dosage recommendations, and check with your healthcare practitioner regarding your use of these herbs. Though some of them might tell you they, these herbs don't do anything, we all know a little bit better. Holy basil, or Tulsi, one of my all-time favorite herbs for stress. This is a little starter of what's called the Krishna Tulsi, there's um, several different kinds of Tulsi. Tulsi regulates cortisol production by the body. And cortisol is the stress hormone that's released, especially during fight or flight. And this little guy regulates how much your body produces and how often it's pushing it out. Um, in India, they, this herb is revered because they say that it elevates the spirit. So it's a very calming, soothing tea. Um, best used in a tea or in capsule form. It comes in tinctures as well, but for a tea you just clip off the flowers or the leaves and stick them in hot water. These are some nice super critically extracted holy basil capsules. Chamomile, unfortunately my chamomile is all dead right now, but chamomile is a wonderful nervine. 
This is a, a packet of chamomile tea. But a nervine is a plant remedy that has a beneficial effect on the nervous system in some way. Uh, chamomile is great as a tea or a tincture. You can do a strong infusion of one ounce of chamomile to a pint of water, which is one of the most effective treatments for pain. And catnip, it's not just for cats. It has such a good smell. Um, this is a little starter of catnip. I got it from Noe at the market. Catnip is also a nervine and has sedative effects on the nervous system. It's said to gently relieve congestion affecting the nerves as a result of built up emotions. It's great for children too. Um, like lemon balm, it's excellent for nervousness or hyperactivity. And it's usually best taken as a tea, although I have seen it in tincture form. It mixes really well with passion flower or lemon balm for insomnia. Passion flower, another beautiful, wonderful herb, great for anxiety and hypertension and various neurological disorders. We always feel better during the day and sleep better at night when we've exerted ourselves during the day, when we've sweat, when we've purged toxins and you know, done something active. I am a huge proponent of incorporating exercise or even a brisk walk after work or um, some light stretching, maybe a few jumping jacks. Really anything that can get your body moving will help you combat stress, keep your immune system up and help you sleep better at night. Journaling. Journaling is really, it's really beneficial. Um, you can do all different kinds of, kinds of journaling. Uh, first thing in the morning, you can just kind of empty your brain, just write without thinking, God, woke up grumpy, slept funny on my pillow, had a weird dream, wonder what I'm going to eat for breakfast, like just stream of consciousness, just write out things. You will be amazed at how clear, um, how clear you feel after that. And before bed is also a great time to journal, talk about the day, get all of the stuff from the day out of your head. Um, and if you wake up in the middle of the night, again, with thoughts and things going through your head, it's wonderful to have a journal right by your bed that you can just jot things down um, so that you can, you can get some peace at night. And it can be a fancy journal like this or just a plain old spiral notebook. It really doesn't matter. Anything that you feel inspired to write in would be good. And there's just uh, two more things I want to discuss with you today before we part. There's a breathing technique I'd like to show you and a yoga pose that I'd like to show you. <sighs> Aside from just a regular old slow, deep breath, there are many breathing techniques that can help us deal with stress or relax. Chandra Bedhana or moon breath is a wonderful breathing technique to help cope with stress. In the yogic system, the right side of the body is symbolized by the sun, ha, and the left side by the moon, tha. Together, they create hatha, balance of sun and moon energies. Chandra Bedhana is a circular breathing technique that nourishes the moon channel and softens the sun channel. We will inhale through the left nostril and exhale through the right. When using this breathing technique, it's helpful to reflect on the power of the moon. The moon is a quiet but powerful force that affects water, creating the ebb and flow of the tides and regulating our own internal rhythms as well, considering our bodies are primarily composed of water. So find a comfortable seated position. Sustain a long extended spine. Find your middle and index finger of your right hand, even if you're left-handed. Make a peace sign with your right hand and place those two fingers into the notch where the forehead and the nose meet. You can support your right elbow with the palm of your left hand if you need to. Sit tall, slightly drop your chin, exhale through both nostrils, and then with the right thumb, close off the right nostril, inhale through the left, pause, then use the ring finger to close the left nostril, and exhale through the right. This is a circular breath, so you will always inhale through the left and exhale through the right. Try to balance your inhale and exhale, gradually lengthening as you relax. Practice a minimum of three rounds or continue for up to five minutes. Complete the breathing practice with a few rounds of breathing in and out of both nostrils with ujjayi breathing. Now for the yoga pose.
I'm Sarah Remick, and this has been Food for Thought for Yoga, Santa Barbara style. In vibrant health and a little less stress, namaste. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you'll be with us again next week when our guest will be Erica Blitz, who teaches at Yoga Soup. In yoga news, I will fill you in on the grand opening of a new yoga studio in Goleta called Better Days. And the Food for Thought will tell you how much I love kale, and I'll show you an easy kale salad recipe. And we'll revisit diaphragmatic breathing and add on to it a little bit. We'll break down the pose Baddha Konasana, Cobbler's Pose. And we'll continue on with the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And Sarah, thank you so much for your tips on stress reduction, something we can all use from time to time. Absolutely. Thank you, and namaste. Namaste.